Right, hello, <laughs> hello, and welcome back, everybody. So we now have uh, three presentations um, focusing on the changes, COVID-related changes to the longitudinal studies. We are covering understanding society, birth cohorts, and the English longitudinal study of aging. Uh, first up, we have Mina Kumari from uh, the Institute for Social and Economic Research. Um, Mina is a professor of biological and social epidemiology. She's a leading expert in biomarkers and genetics and has worked to apply insights from these areas to better understand aging, cardiovascular disease and health inequalities using the Whitehall 2 study uh, of British civil servants and ELSA. Mina is the topic champion for health and biomarker content and research in understanding society and leads leads research on the social biological interface and genetic epidemiology as an investigator for the study. Um, so over to you, Mina. Great. Oh, good. Okay, super. So I'm just going to, as, uh, as Mary just said, I'm the uh, topic champion for health and biomarker data in understanding society. So I'm going to lead you through understanding society um, and then just give you uh, some an overview of, of what we did with the COVID-19 and uh, talk a little bit about next steps. Um, so what's understanding society? Um, I suspect a, a lot of you might know, we've already <laughs> discussed it in the last uh, last session. Um, understanding society is a survey of um, uh, representative individuals of the UK population. And we collect information from all of the residents in uh, approximately 40,000 households um, and the residents and their offspring or the children form their core sample. Um, and what we do is we interview everybody in the household um, every year. And the basic design um, is similar to a number of uh, international household panel studies, uh, such as PSID, so Sophie. So you can do uh, international um, comparisons using the data. And I think as we talked about in the last um, presentation, you can benchmark across to understanding society if you have some of our questions. So we work as a nice control if you want that. Um, so the study, the study began in 2009 and it builds on the BHPS, which started in 1991. And we um, collect information from a, a range of uh, different um, aspects of life. Um, and I'll go through those in a little while. Um, so there's lots of research possibilities with the study because you're measuring the same thing um, over and over again and across the life course. Um, and because we're a household study, um, you can uh, investigate the role of the household context on a number of outcomes and behaviours and look at intergenerational change. Um, so it's a great survey. Um, you know, new policies come through when um, new and exciting things happen, like uh, Brexit votes and COVID and pandemics and that sort of thing. So you can see how people were before these things happened and how, how they are afterwards. The sample is um, actually for almost four different populations. So we've got our general population sample, which is 26,000 UK households. Um, we've got an ethnic minority boost. So at wave one, we had an ethnic minority boost, which was made up of the main, uh, the five main ethnic groups. Um, and then, as I said, we've incorporated the British Household Panel Survey, which is a study that started in, in the early 1990s. We also have a set of participants, set of households that we use um, to, as a test bed for questions and methods um, that we um, often incorporate into the main study. Um, and so we have a total of nearly 40,000 households from waves one and two. We do have a new... Uh, it's, I suppose it's not new now, wave six in 2015, 16, we added an um, uh, immigrant and ethnic minority um, boost, which was uh, sort of new migrants, so uh, Eastern European and, and um, groups that we, we sort of didn't have from before, and that's in the data from wave six. Um, so, as I said, we collect information from everybody in the household. So we interview all the participants of our household at age 16 and above. Um, we also run a short self-completion from uh, a youth panel, so that's data collected from people aged, children aged 10 to 15 years old. And then we also ask parents and guardians um, information about the children in the household. So 
uh, we collect information, I think, at age three, five and eight from from uh, parents about the children. Um, so that means we've got information from everyone, so the entire life course. Um, uh, and I think I'm going to just highlight the children data because it isn't used a lot. And I think it might be that people don't always know that we've got those that information from the participants, uh, from the children. So this is the uh, fieldwork schedule. I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's slightly out of date. <laughs> I need, we need to update it. So basically, we're actually, we will be depositing um, wave 11 from this from the study this year when BHPS is at wave thir uh, 30, so 30 years of BHPS data. Um, and uh, and you can see that uh, we will we uh, uh, and next year, you know, we'll be in wave 12 of the of the main understanding society. So there's lots of um, information collected. We've got lots of kind of quite old data now in the sense that, you know, some of some of our participants took part in 1991. Um, and what we did was we kind of combined it so that you can, you know, in one file have a, a, a have that information because we used to have everything sort of separated. So we've done quite a lot of work on combining, combining the data files so that you uh, it's not too difficult to to get at them. So these uh, these are the main topics um, in the study. Um, so in addition to um, health, we were interested in uh, it's a social service. So we're interested in education, employment, income, um, civic participation, politics, and and, and lots of enge engagement. Uh, and so we've got a really detailed look at the lives of our participants. And because we're obviously uh, we're, and because there's so much we're trying to cover, we don't we don't interview. Um, we don't ask everything at every way if it's too difficult. Um, so we have a core set of questions that we ask people every year and then a rotating set of questions. And um, when I first joined the study, we um, we used to describe understanding society as a juggernaut in the sense that we had a four year cycle of, of uh, designing questions, administrating, administering, collecting the data over two years and then depositing the data. Um, but we, we've changed that slightly so that, you know, if something does happen like a pandemic, we can we can um, add content quite quickly and uh, and sort of a respond to to, 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 the, to events in people's lives and also events in the world. Um, in terms of uh, health and well-being, uh, we collect um, have collected uh, quest lots of questionnaire data. Um, so asking our participants about chronic conditions. Um, we talked about um, measures of mental health uh, in in the in the last talk, um, and the reason that we ask the general health questionnaire, we administer it every year, and we and we do that, and we've kept it as the general health questionnaire as our measure of mental health. It's a measure of psychological distress. Um, because it was there in the BHPS. So we've got these long, uh, lifelong, uh, sort of 30 year histories for some people of GHQ um, uh, uh, annually. Um, at waves two and three, we uh, asked the participants if they were wanted a nurse to come and visit them. And uh, for a set of participants, we have 20,000 people that we have um, heights and weights for them, blood pressure. And we also, also measured lung function and for 13,000 participants, we have um, blood, we collected blood samples from them and measured uh, 21 different analytes. And we also extracted DNA from that, that sample and we have GWAS and EWAS data and have recently measured some protein data from, from those blood samples. So we've got really detailed biology from a substantial number of our participants. There are um, uh, a range of health and well-being uh, modules and uh, data collected. Um, these are the modules that we uh, data collected from the children and, and young adults. Um, so uh, we've got, uh, and actually, you know, some of these things are collected uh, throughout. So uh, we have from waves one, four, six, and ten. We have things like sleep, and the children have given us lots of information about body image um, and happiness in different aspects of their life. As I mentioned, we've got um, uh, information about the children's mental health, so strength and difficulties questionnaire. We ask them about their self-esteem, screen time use, bullying. Uh, we've got information about 
parents' relationships with each other and their relationships with their children. So there's a wide variety of health and well-being related information in understanding society that you could use. Um, and it's a sort of uh, come and use it. It's there, it's there for people to use. Um, in terms of um, adult well-being, as I said, we, we collect GHQ every year. We ask about um, life satisfaction and uh, satisfaction in different domains of life. Um, we are used uh, to understand the nation's um, well-being. And so we do the, we administer the Edinburgh Warwick positive well-being question, and we do that um, periodically. Um, and uh, in terms of the, as I said, the children's um, well-being, we, we ask about happiness in all different aspects of their life and about themselves, so their own appearance, how happy they are at school, how happy they are with their friendships um, within the family. And, and, and uh, we've got the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, so you can um, get a total from that or understand different uh, subscales of that in terms of the children's mental health. The questions are repeated, which allows us to um, measure change over time. We don't ask everything at every wave. Um, and as I said, we, um, we, we've, we've changed protocols slightly so that we can um, ask these event triggered questionnaires. And, and I'm going to talk, uh, and this is, this is sort of an example of how that works. So some things are asked every, every, every wave, some things every other wave, some things much more randomly than that. And sometimes we've had to bring things in when we've realized that we need information about it. Like for example, here, the gig economy, and we'll um, incorporate that into the questionnaire um, every wave. So you can go to the, um, and um, the other thing that we do is we can send our participants to, um, uh, lots of links. So we are consented to link to HES data, the, but we, we don't have that data yet. We're still trying to link to HES data and make that available, but there's lots of the links to, um, for, for, you know, for tax data, DVLA data. And the uh, other thing that we do is we can scrape websites. Um, so we consented for DVLA, but I think we ended up uh, uh, scraping for, um, uh, dr driving and other types of uh, information. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we are always working on trying to find new ways of collecting information. We've done, I've done some work on, um, you know, how we can uh, ask our participants to collect their own biomedias, for example. Um, and uh, the, the team have been working on whether we can use uh, mobiles and apps to collect other types of information. So there's, we're always working and trying to develop and sort of thinking through how we can um, enhance the, the data set. So this is the website, you can go and find lots of information about the survey there and um, how we do things. And it tells you how you can um, access the data. We deposit the data in the archive. Um, and so it's it's all there if you want to want to go and get in. So as I said, we went from um, a four year cycle in understanding society. So uh, uh, sort of devising, administering, depositing data, which which used to take about four years to a four week cycle when we when we uh, when the pandemic happened. So the pandemic uh, happened in March 2020, and we had administered a web survey to the participants in April 2020. Mina, um, I'm really sorry, I only have got, you only have a couple of minutes left. Oh and no. It's like you go to the most interesting bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking, I had too, uh, too many, too many um, uh, slides. So I will, what, what should I do? Uh, I can tell you, I can move on to, should we move on to this? So I can just start talking a little bit about what we did. So in, in fact, I won't talk about results at all then. Shall I just tell you about the study and where you can go get the data? I'm not sure what's the best to do. Yeah, then. and if people are interested in results, maybe just put it in the Q&A and we can come back to it when we okay. have the Q&A session. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. That's <laughs> no, okay. Uh, so let's have a look. So <laughs> we, <laughs> we collected... Um, I should have practiced this talk. Uh, we, we should have collected 
collected uh, we collected data um, and you, uh, sort of monthly uh, April May June and July um, for, uh, from our participants it was uh, web based and we supplemented the April collection with a telephone interview and we deposited almost as soon as we'd collected and cleaned the data into the archive and um, and then we went bi-monthly because we're still actually in the field um, so we're still collecting from the main stage um, in understanding society we did this on top of our usual work um, and uh, in uh, and then we went bi-monthly so we didn't collect in August last year and we've collected again in September November uh, January and March this year um, all of this has been um, web-based questionnaire which and supplemented occasionally with um, a telephone interview um, and then last month in May we um, asked participants if they would give us a blood sample for antibody data and uh, so we had a really good response for that um, and we will be depositing that uh, this month um, with the questionnaire data from May. We're going into the field finally in July um, and uh, we will be depositing in September. I, we don't have plans to, to, to continue to keep, keep doing this. Um, this, year, this year we'll be depositing uh, wave 11, as I said. So we have maintained our um, some uh, main data collection. So you can sort of uh, look to see where we are in terms of what's been happening in our, in our main collection on top of these, um, these additional COVID questions that we asked people so i will finish there because i had too much in my uh, talk but if you want to ask me anything in the q a please do so absolutely as mina said i put all of your questions in the q a and we can go into more depth around the methods and and the results as well okay. um, thank you um, we are moving on now to the british sky hot studies uh, so um, this is presented by um, uh, David Pan. So David is an epidemiologist with a broad interest in population health and particular interest in health inequalities, obesity and physical activity levels. Um, he contributes to the scientific development of the 1958 British birth cohort study by planning future data collections, preparing funding applications and helping to maximize its scientific potential. And he's from the Center for Longitudinal Studies. So over to you, David. Thank you. Can I check? Can you hear me and see my screen? Great. OK, thank you for the introduction. And nice to hear about what's happening in USAR because it sounds very busy, and very exciting during the COVID period. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you to our funders, the ESRC and our host institution, IOE and UCL. Um, so, I'm going to move this out of the way. So, what did we do at CLS? Um, we won major national longitudinal studies, which I'll be talking about today. I'll be talking about the data that we do have currently and some of the future plans that we have going forward. We provide this data to the research community, um, much like USOP. This is free of charge and available on the UK Data Archive. Um, researchers can also input on the type of data we collect in the future, so we have consultations on this. And we also conduct research and uh, multidisciplinary research in both substantive areas related to health and methodological areas like survey and statistical analysis. So these are the four cohorts that we have at the moment. So we have three, these are national um, birth cohorts. The sample size is around 16, over 16,000. So individuals born in a particular week in 1958 were involved in, in, in the study and they've been followed up throughout their lives and they're now in their 60s. So we have this data across life and we have a similar model for the 70 cohort. They were born in 1970 and for the millennium cohort, which was born around the millennium and still being followed up. This other study called Next Steps, they are a birth cohort in the sense that they were born in around the same in the same birth years, but they were, the follow up started in adolescence. But again, we have longitudinal data. Here's another visual depiction of the data that we have for each of the studies, their year of data collection and, and their birth year. So for the oldest, the 1958 cohort, NCDS, we have data um, in, in birth, in childhood, adolescence, and across adult life. And the same for the other cohorts starting at different ages. So what do we have? We have mental and physical health outcomes and multiple different ages in multiple different cohorts. 
You have which data on the social and biological exposures which might be correlated with or potentially causally affect health. We also have an ongoing, we're involved in ongoing harmonization programs with closer colleagues to try and facilitate cross cohort analysis and making comparisons of health and associations with health like health inequality across multiple different generations. So these include things like physical activity, diet, cognition, and SES measures like overcrowding, um, education, and psychological health measures also. Here is a um, simple overview of the kinds of data that we do have in the cohorts. It's an awful lot to talk about, but the point, the point for this talk, I suppose, is that we have rich data on health, <coughs> physical, sorry, I'm gonna have to have a drink of water. Perhaps I've developed a dry cough during this talk, which is not good. Okay, um, we have health data. We have data on the determinants of health, including social economic factors and parental and home factors as well. So an awful lot in each of these studies. Here's a, just a little snapshot of the types of papers that have come out using these data. Um, some of them looking descriptively at the prevalence of health or the, or the um, correlates of health, like physical activity. Some of them conducting seminal work on things like influences on, um, on low birth weight, here smoking. For the, for the papers um, looking at the, um, the consequences of early life health problems, um, the determinants of health here, looking at bre um, breastfeeding, and then papers um, looking at long run trends. This is a paper I worked on with colleagues um, using the cohorts and the health study for England together to look at long run changes in health inequality. So there's an enormous amount of science that can come from these papers that's happened in the past and will happen in the future. And I hope this slide just gives you a, a, a brief, if somewhat random snapshot of that. So that's what's happened in, in, in the past. Well, well, what about the future? So we have ongoing data collections, which are either happening at the moment. So with the 58 cohorts, this is um, ongoing data collection, which we had to postpone um, for a period due to COVID, but which we are restarting with the biomedical data collection. We have plans with the 70 cohort, um, collecting data age 51, with the Next Steps cohort at age 32, and with the Millennium cohort at age 22. So an awful lot more data coming in the pipeline in the future. Just to provide um, some information on, on the biomedical data that we have. Um, so we have specific biomedical data collections in the 58 cohort around 45 years. These are on the UK data service and the 40, uh, 46 years in the 70 cohort also on the UKDS. And these give us well, almost scientific opportunities, um, both things that we hypothesize when we design these data collections, but also unforeseen opportunities for single cohort analysis, like life course, determinants of health analysis, and also cross cohort analysis, examining trends in health over long run periods and trends in the determinants and the consequences of health also. With, with data collection in the next biomedical NCDS likely to be um, arriving in 2023. So this is the last um, BCS70 biomedical data, age 46. We have detailed questionnaire data on the household, the finances, the health, well-being and cognition measures. And we have nurse measures of anthropometry, it's height and weight, and body fat, physical function measures, grip and balance, measures of blood pressure, we have blood samples and accelerometry data um, for seven days. We also have measures on diet using an online diet questionnaire. And again, these are all available on the UKDS. I have an update um, on the our linked data. I can't get rid of this banner, uh, I'm afraid. But this is a slide which gives a, a visual depiction of our, of our linked health record data. So an update here is that like many studies, we've been trying and trying to work through the process of having our studies linked with health admin data, but I'm pleased to report some progress. So we do at the moment actually have some data on the UKDS with linked hospital episode statistics here for England, for NCDS, BCS and Next Steps with coverage over around 10 years for admitted patient care, critical care, A&E and outpatient care. And I think these data haven't been used a great deal at the moment, so lots of um, exciting opportunities, potentially low-hanging scientific fruit for folks that are interested. You can click on the link and you can find out more with other data 
either 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 available or forthcoming in different studies and different subregions of Britain. Another update is um, genetic data. So the 58 cohort has already been genotyped and the Millennium Cohort study was recently genotyped. And so these two studies, you can access their genetic data using our new data access system, which typically takes around or less than one month to a response and is available via a simple form. And the link is provided in the slides. So we have a new system now, which we hope is proportionate and not too burdensome for either the applicants or for the panel reviewing it. Genetic data in the 70 cohort is expected later this year in collaboration with colleagues in Bristol, and we are planning for genetic data in the next steps in 2023. So another point to mention is with, N with um, NCS is because we have this family data, you have an interesting opportunity to, with genetic data on trios, the cohort members, their mothers and their fathers. So potentially using this information to, look, to try and account for things like assortative mating or to look at things like um, genetic nurture effects on outcomes. And, you know, I think in the genetic epidemiology space, we've seen studies like UK Biobank really dominate um, the research landscape. Uh, Biobank's a great study, but it also has important limitations, including its very distorted response rates. So we hope going forward that these kinds of studies will be used in, in genetically informed health science and social science going forward. And we hope to facilitate that by eventually providing polygenic scores for multiple phenotypes for each of these different studies. And we think it's a very exciting space for research across health and social sciences. Here's a link to a, um, a project I've recently got funded on this. Um, so testament to the idea that some funders will fund this some other time. Another update is our COVID data. So, you know, without going into the rationale, I think it's fairly self-evident that we need longitudinal data. We need um, nationally representative data, ideally, to inform on the uh, on the on the consequences of the COVID pandemic, um, for both the health and social consequences. So we have a, a a a neat series of studies with five different longitudinal cohort studies were surveyed at the, at the same time. Um, Adding to the CLS studies was the 1946 cohort, giving us a long age span of data collection. And we have data collections via a web questionnaire in May 2020, so early on in this pandemic, and then later on in this, um, in this seemingly never-ending pandemic, with wave two in September 2020 and wave three in February to March 2021, with similar data to that collected in USOC, um, family, employment, homeschooling, mental health, and questions on long COVID and qualitative type questions also. These data are available for you to download and look at on UK DS. Another update is um, forthcoming data on serology measured from blood samples. So these data should be available by the end of this year with a, with a, a set of anti antibody and blood samples taken from CLS studies um, along with many other studies, which is funded by the National Core Studies. So, um, as well as the self-reported data, you'll soon be able to look at um, objectively measured serology for COVID-19 using these two different types of assays. And a final update, if I have time, I, I hope I do, is three new cohorts. That's right, folks, you, we wait for decades for new cohorts to arrive, and then suddenly we have three at the um, more or less the same time, very exciting time. I have one slide on each and more information is on the CLS website. The first is the Early Life Cohort Feasibility Study, which is a, a two-year ESRC funded project starting this year, which will test the feasibility of a new UK-wide birth cohort study. So we'll recruit um, thousands of, in, of new babies, so a birth cohort design, collecting information on the families and their development and provided this is successful, there'll be a larger main study um, taking place in 2024, 20, 25. So around 25 years after the Millennium Cohort Study, we should hopefully be having another large nationally representative birth cohort. But here is another birth cohort study um, as well. It's called the Children of the 2020 Study, a new nationally representative birth cohort study of babies in England which is funded by the Department for Education. 
So this is set up to answer important scientific and policy questions regarding the family, early education and childcare determinants of early school success. But like many of the, um, the cohort studies, it can potentially be used um, quite well in health research as well, because it will be collecting those kinds of data also. So we'll be recruiting around 8,000 um, families at the start of 2022, with initially plans for a five-way longitudinal survey of this, of this birth cohort from nine months onwards. The final new study is called the COVID Social Mobility and Opportunities COSMO study. So this is um, much like next steps, perhaps. It's, it's, it's starting off with recruitment happening in year 11 at school, so that's age 15 to 16. And it will investigate the educational and employment inequalities brought about by the COVID-19 crisis. And it's UKRI funded and led by researchers and, and colleagues at UCL Centre for Education, Policy and Equalising Opportunities and the Sutton Trust in collaboration with CLS. So it'll be the largest study of its kind with around 12,000 young people to take part with data collected um, following this age. And it will explore the disruptions taking place to schooling during the pandemic, as well as longer term educational and career outcomes. So a very exciting time in terms of the data that we already have in CLS, the new data that we're planning to collect on the studies that we already have, and three new studies occurring as well. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. It's super exciting to hear about this three new uh, cohorts especially so yeah looking forward to see how they how they develop so we're now going to uh, look at the english longitudinal study of aging and um what has happened on it during during the pandemic we have uh, Chenfranco Adare from Natsen um, Chenfranco is a senior research analyst in the longitudinal team within Natsen um, and he has experience in longitudinal panel studies and online mixed mode fieldwork designs. Um, at Natsen, Chandranka has worked on a range of research projects, including ELSA, online time study, Natsen panel and technical education study. And he completed an MSc in research methods at City in 2019. So over to you, Chandranka. Hi, Mari. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Thank you. Um, so, in this, in this presentation, I will be discussing about uh, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging and what happened in the ELSA universe in uh, 2020. Um, I, will have, I will mostly focus on the COVID-19 sub-study, uh, but towards the end of the presentation, I will also uh, give you a quick overview of what it's the, what's in the pipeline for ELSA in uh, 2021. Um, so before we start uh, <clears throat> with the COVID-19 sub-study, I just want to give a quick overview of the ELSA project for those of you who are not familiar um, with the study and with its design. <clears throat> so ELSA is the Longitudinal Study of Aging. Uh, it began in 2002. It is a longitudinal study. Uh, the focus is on people uh, above the age of 50, um, living in private households in England. Uh, partners are often interviewed with the core members, so with the, with the main person recruited to the study. Uh, the original sample for ELSA was uh, recruited from uh, HSC in uh, between 98 and 2001. So those are study participants, those are people who completed an interview uh, with the ELSA Survey of England. And then the sample was refreshed uh, several times with new courts uh, from HSC participants. Uh, the last court was uh, added to the sample in wave nine. Um, so ELSA research team is formed by five collaborating institutions. So I've listed them here. We got uh, UCL, IFS, uh, Natsen, and then University of Manchester and University of East Anglia. Uh, those five organizations form the ELSA uh, research team. Um, start, start to talk about the, the COVID-19 study. Um, First of all, let's say the main research objectives uh, um, are were about finding uh, the effect of the pandemic uh, um, on the aging population of England and what the dynamics of the lockdown were. Uh, as we know, uh, COVID-19 had different effects for uh, the aging population. So they were asked to shield, they were asked to self-isolate more than other groups. So it was important to collect uh, data about their experiences and outcomes. 
Um, so OLS also offer the opportunities for cross-sectional analysis, but also longitudinal analysis. And in particular, um, I believe that ELSA will offer good options to uh, analyze COVID-19 data with previous waves, but also with future waves of the study. So with data that will be collected in the future. Um, COVID-19 data was also harmonized with other longitudinal studies in the UK and international studies of aging, like for example, SHARE, uh, the collected COVID-19 data in the same period in the European Union. And I also wanted to mention that ELSA was founded by the SRC, uh, by the UK ERI COVID-19 rapid response. Uh, moving to the questionnaire, the ELSA COVID-19 study covered a different range uh, of topics. So we have uh, the COVID-19, uh, a, a module about COVID-19, so experience of symptoms, illness, and so on. Uh, but also if they were shielding, self-isolating, and the experience of lockdown from a medical point of view. Then we got uh, other health issues. And for example, there is an interesting section about access to hospital and primary care. Uh, there is a mental health section that includes a number of different scales. Uh, in terms of demographics, we mostly ask questions about uh, housing. So exactly how many people were living in the house, uh, age, relationship, and so on. There are some questions about financial circumstances, uh, work, so changes in, in work patterns and others. Um, social connection and isolation, for example, we have a really interesting uh, set of questions about digital inclusion for this age group in the first wave of the study, but there were also uh, extensive questions about caregiving uh, that have a longitudinal dimension that we're asking both wave one and wave two. And then health behaviors like, for example, sleep and sedentary life, but also smoking and drinking. Uh, talking about the sample, the ELSA COVID-19 sub-study was, was uh, uh, issued to people who were part of the ELSA sample. So uh, in the first wave, we issued ELSA members that were eligible for an interview in wave 10. Uh, also those uh, who refused the face-to-face modes, uh, but were still included in the sample. Differently from uh, the standard ELSA interview, we didn't allow any proxy interviews. So it means that we only issued study participants that were considered mentally capable uh, to carry out an interview on their own. So in total, in the first way, we issued about 9,500 study participants, uh, sample members, sorry, and uh, 7,800 were uh, core members. In the second wave, we issued those who were already issued in the first wave, but then we also removed those who had refused participation in the COVID-19 sub-study and those who were found uh, not eligible for an interview. Um, so either because they moved out of the UK or because uh, they passed away since the previous interview. Uh, so in total, we had a number of um, cases. We issued 9,100 cases and 7,465 were uh, core members. Uh, looking at the fieldwork design, uh, the fieldwork uh, um, structure essentially um, had a mixed mode strategy, so um, web and CATI, and a sequential design. Um, so we started with web and then we released CATI to those who were unproductive uh, to web. Uh, we had three main methodological objectives. So the first one was the coverage of the offline population, and here is why we had the CATI mode. Um, then um, the prioritization of the cost of a cost effective solution so web interviews are relatively inexpensive so uh, we try to push everyone to web first before starting cutting field work and uh, the last element was the compensation for web uh, non-response um, so we use the responsive design after a, a couple of weeks of field work uh, we run a model of non-response <clears throat> We divided uh, unproductive study participants in a number of batches uh, by likelihood of completing online. And we released to the CATI interviews uh, the batch that were less likely um, early and then the batch that were more likely to complete online later during field work. Um, in total, so we had those uh, two waves of the study. Uh, the first wave uh, in June and July lasted eight weeks. The second wave in November and December uh, for seven weeks, so it was a bit shorter. Uh, nevertheless, we got a similar split uh, in uh, the modes. So in about both waves, we had an 83% web completion and a 17% uh, CATI completion. Uh, to be honest, we were a bit surprised about these numbers because we were expecting a larger number of uh, CATI interviews. 
Um, so it was a positive uh, result for us. Um, another positive element was the response rate uh, because the sample was really responsive to this COVID-19 study. Uh, so we had a response rate of about 75% in both waves. Uh, and we also had a similar composition in the similar response rate across the two waves for key uh, age groups. Um, so we didn't see many differences uh, between those who take part in the first wave and those who took part in the second wave in terms of uh, sample composition. Um, looking at those who were product, so lo looking at the wave two response rate, um, it was positive that 92.4% of the people who were productive in the first wave also had a productive interview in the second wave. So overall, uh, we had 6,472 sample members who were productive in both waves of the study. Um, so another element I wanted to discuss is the weights that are available on the archive data sets. Um, so our statistical teams produced four different weights, uh, four cross-sectional and four longitudinal weights. Uh, the cross-sectional weights uh, in each wave are for core members, and then we have another set of weights for core members and their partners. So this one is the first time in ELSA. Uh, that we develop uh, weights for the, uh, the partners as well. So generally, uh, core members only receive uh, a cross-sectional weight. Uh, moving to the longitudinal weights, most of them, as you can see from the slide, have been uh, produced upon uh, the wave nine cross-sectional weight, adjusting for non-response uh, in the COVID-19 study. So in the first wave, we have a weight between ELSA wave nine and the first wave of the COVID-19 study. In the second wave, ELSA wave nine and the second wave of the COVID-19 study, ELSA wave nine and both waves of the COVID-19 study. And then we have a weight that only looks uh, at the completion of both waves of the COVID-19 study. Um, you can see that by the numbers of the longitude, the, the number of cases including each longitudinal weights, that they're only for core members. So we didn't produce longitudinal weights for partners. Uh, only one element that I wanted to mention before we move to the next slide, although the study is representative for people above the age of 50, in this case, for the COVID-19 study, we are looking at, uh, at data sets that are representative for people above the age of 52. And this is because we didn't have any uh, refreshment court after wave nine. So we didn't have core members in that age group, 50 to 52. So talking about resources, um, you are able to find uh, the ELSA COVID-19 sub-study data and documentation on the UKDS archive. So the, the idea of the study is 86, 88. Uh, we have released the uh, end user license data set and we are in the process of producing uh, a special license data set uh, covering uh, the interview date grouped by week. Um, early reports uh, are available on the ELSA project website. These include a methodological report for wave one, um, uh, where essentially we are talking about how we adjust uh, field work uh, from, uh, how we adjust field work from uh, a standard copy uh, interview to a web copy system. And uh, during the year, so in this year, we will also be working on a second methodological report uh, focusing on wave two uh, and looking at some uh, experiments that we run, especially around uh, incentives and uh, survey length. Uh, and also we will be assessing so some sample compositions between uh, uh, the copy waves, the first wave of the study and the second wave of the study to analyze uh, uh, individual le level changes in uh, uh, survey participation. In the ELSA project website, you can also find some training videos. So there is a video, for example, that covers uh, uh, the waiting process. And uh, so, yeah, there was pretty much everything from the COVID-19 study, the, the elements that I wanted to mention. Uh, but then I want also to discuss uh, what's on the pipeline for ELSA in 2021. Um, so we are running, we actually ended field work for a serology study. So this one uh, was made of, um, this one required some own key test kits being sent to sample members. Um, we issued uh, test those kits to people with a productive interview in either the first or the second wave of the COVID-19 study, and we were still eligible for, uh, for the interview. Um, we are in the process of archiving the data, 
And uh, this study is essentially part of the UK longitudinal linkage collaboration looking at COVID-19 antibodies. Uh, I think that David from CLS mentioned this uh, study as well. Um, then talking about wave 10, so uh, the ELSA uh, fieldwork was due to start in 2020, uh, but we shifted it to 2021 because of the pandemic. Uh, the, research, the ELSA research team is currently piloting CAPI and remote interviewing solutions, and we believe that uh, main stage field work uh, will start uh, later in 2021. Uh, another element that I wanted to mention is about uh, nurse visits. So in wave eight and wave nine, they were split between the two waves, but now with the ELSA COVID-19, uh, because of the pandemic, we will be carrying out all the uh, nurse visits in wave 11. So finally, there is also uh, an, an additional uh, web cutty wave, uh, but we are not sure about the, the actual design, so I'm not able to give you uh, more details at this stage. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much, Chavanka. <clears throat> no problem.